Welcome back to the channel. I've been seeing some of the consternation about the Cochrane Review about masking and other physical interventions to prevent the spread of respiratory viruses, and I have some thoughts about what people are saying. I'm going to walk you through them. One of the big objections that people are saying is that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In other words, just because this compilation of randomized controlled trials failed to establish a benefit of masking, it doesn't mean that masking doesn't work under all circumstances, and it's possible that there's somebody out there who does benefit from their N95 mask. And I want to say that that's, that's absolutely, of course, true. I mean, no amount of randomized studies can ever prove an intervention doesn't work under any and all circumstances. That's true for Positive randomized studies, it doesn't prove that it works, it doesn't work under other circumstances, and even the practices that are debunked from medical history that are thrown away, you could argue that it would have worked had you done something different, targeted a different population. No randomized trial can prove a study or practice doesn't work under any circumstances. That's true. But that doesn't mean it works, okay? And that doesn't mean it's likely to work. You've got to consider the pretest probability of medical interventions. Most medical interventions throughout human history They've been billions of ideas about what people can do to improve health. They've been millions of good ideas. And even among the good ideas, the vast majority don't work. They simply don't work. Most compounds that come in for cancer drug testing don't make it to the market because they don't work. Most biosocial interventions don't work. Most complex economic and behavioral interventions don't work. It's actually very difficult to make an intervention that works and is scalable. And that's another key. It doesn't have to just work in your select ICU and some before and after garbage useless study because it's only in one place and it's before and after. It needs to work in a multi-center cluster randomized fashion so we can have some hint that it is scalable to everybody. And yet over the course of the pandemic, we've had widespread mask rules or one, just a suggestion. I mean, there's two different levels of intervention. There's merely suggesting to other people they ought to do it. Even then you need evidence. Then there's mandating it, in which case you definitely need evidence. Otherwise, how do you justify the imposition on other people? The Cochrane Review comes in and it looks at all the randomized controlled trials on physical interventions to prevent respiratory viruses, including SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. And it concludes what I have concluded from looking at this literature, which is the evidence is so weak. The evidence shows basically no effect, wide confidence interval. There's no hint that there's an effect. And it's hard to believe there is an effect. Now, you may notice that I wasn't one who just stopped with the available evidence and said there's no effect. Let that be the end of it. I was the one who always said more randomized trials are needed because people believe that this works. They have the faith that it works. They need another randomized trial to hit them right in the face, to let them know what the reality is. And maybe it does work under some circumstances. I'm open to that fact. It's possible. Possible that tightly fit N95 masks work in the bone marrow transplant unit. Possible. Possible. Entirely possible. Also, probably not. I mean, even in that setting, probably not. Just because the pretest probability looms so large in your consciousness for community-level recommendations, the answer is almost certainly not. People are not doing anything anymore. Do you have eyes and ears? Do you look around? Compliance is piss poor. In the hospital, it's piss poor. People are drinking coffees and lattes. They're wearing it on their chin. They're holding the coffee, walking down the hall with it on their chin. Some people forget to have it in the break rooms, the team rooms. They're having long lunches. And then right after work ends, we go to the bar. We go to the grocery store. We're not wearing a mask in sight. All of those other places will diminish any potential benefit of it working in the hospital. And then you'll say, well, it didn't work in the hospital because people breached the protocol outside the hospital. That, that's called life. You gotta make an intervention that works in reality, not in Narnia, okay? You gotta make an intervention that works as people are living. It almost most certainly doesn't work. Might it have worked in the peak pandemic when people actually had some fear in them and they were doing a little bit better? Maybe, I don't know, but nobody ran a randomized control trial. I was always the person who said more randomized trials are needed. Why? Because I know that any randomized trials cannot prove it doesn't work under any and all circumstances. I know that to be true. But the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's something people say. But if you say that in biomedicine, you're not that smart because the reality is most things in biomedicine that have the absence of evidence have the absence of evidence because they don't work. They don't work and people think they're so unpromising they don't even want to test them. And if they did test them, guess what you'd find? You'd find they don't work because it's very hard to make us better off and it's a lot easier to screw things up. Okay, that's the reality of biology. It's the reality of medicine. In fact, if you look at all the things we do throughout all of medical history from 2000 BC to the present day, or if you want, just even pick 1950 to present day or 1970 to present day, most things people thought of, people dreamt of, most things 
did not work, okay? If everything worked based on biophysiology, physics, pathophysiology, chemistry, if all these things worked, if these were reliable reductionist sciences for the complexity of the body, drug development wouldn't be so hard. It wouldn't be so hard. You think Pfizer wants to have a failure rate of 94%? You think they want that? You think they're not hiring the smartest people out there? They're hiring the smartest people and they still have that failure rate because it is not easy, okay? It's not easy. I think we do have to acknowledge this fact. You think somebody sitting there says, hmm, you know, the pandemic would just go away if we just told people to wear a FFP2 for, for two weeks. You, somebody can easily say that, but the reality of human beings is you can tell them to do it, but they ain't going to do it, and then you can try to enforce it, but they ain't going to do it, and there'll be backlash to it, and very likely the intervention won't work, or they even do it perfectly and it doesn't work because they're not wearing, well, maybe they're not wearing it at the nose, or they're taking it off at the end of the day, or, you know, maybe you're missing something about the process. You don't fully have the mechanism you think you understand. I think in the hospital, we wear a flimsy surgical mask and then people say it's going to work. And so they make the spouse wear the mask in the room with the husband and they sit in the same stagnant air for six hours with the door closed. So even if you think the mask has some, you know, 5% reduction in SARS-CoV-2, when you breathe a hundred thousand times in the same confined area, wouldn't it be the case that all the particles are distributed anyway in the air and the patient's going to be exposed to it? It's a fool's errand, okay? At some point, when you want to impose on people, you are the one who has to generate evidence. The burden of proof lies with the person who wants to do the new thing. We weren't doing it for a long time. You came along and you said we ought to do it for the rest of, the rest of time in this forever war against COVID-19, which by the way, you lost. Like all forever wars, you tend to lose them. You lose them early, you just don't admit defeat. Then it takes another 15 years to leave Afghanistan, okay? You are fighting the forever war here. It's the same thing. You're not admitting defeat. You've admitted, I mean, defeat is, there was a success. The success was a vaccine. There was a success. We delivered it to a lot of older, frailer people. There are a lot of failures because instead of focusing on older, frailer people, we focused on young people and children. And we didn't understand that log risk is a big, big effing difference. It's a big difference, okay? It's a logarithmic risk. And then we got really crazy or maybe greedy. They wanted to give booster after booster after booster to a five-year-old who already had COVID once or perhaps even twice. That is crazy talk, okay? It's absolutely crazy because the absolute risk that that child faces is abysmally low. You have no evidence that you have an absolute risk reduction on top of an abysmally low risk. You have some non-trivial AEs. I mean, it's not a lot, but you do have some AEs and you really start to, when you start to th worry that, you know, one in 10K myocarditis and say, let's say a 20-year-old man who had three doses and had Omicron once, he probably will be found to have a one in 10K risk. And I say that because of the Katie Scharf paper that found that for the first booster. When that starts to weigh as heavily as what is his upper bound risk of being hospitalized status post three doses and COVID, when those start to weigh equally in your hands or the myocarditis risk is a little bit heavier, you've already lost the plot. You don't need to be pursuing drugs in this population. And in fact, some people rightly say, you couldn't do a randomized trial for such a man because the sample size have to be too large and it will take too long. Well, that's a clue. You shouldn't be doing it at all because it's such a low value intervention at best, assuming it works, but maybe it doesn't work. And why would it not work? Because the history of medicine is littered with the hubris and arrogance of people who thought they had something that works. So back to the Cochrane, you know, does it prove masks don't work under any circumstance? No, but is it plausible mask works? No. The only, I mean, we have to get back to the plausibility. There was a reason why Tony Fauci went on initially and said it didn't work. There was a reason why the CDC said not to do it and the WHO said not to do it. And between March 1st and April 15th of 2020, there ain't no new evidence that was generated of any plausibility, but two things happened. There was a concerted movement by activists who don't know evidence-based medicine to hashtag wear a cloth mask and hashtag save lives and hashtag cut your sock and hashtag, you know, making stupid TikTok videos. Why? Because they're scared. They're in their house. They're scared. They don't know what to do. They just grasp for anything, you know, just like our primitive ancestors would have maybe slaughtered a chicken or done a rain dance. They're doing the same thing. It's the same sort of thing. They're scared. They're afraid. They don't know what to do. They're grasping at straws, but they're using the modern advances. And maybe we know it comes out of this part of the face and we know it doesn't come from the chickens. So we won't slaughter the chicken. We'll just put a cloth there, but they don't have any really deeper understanding than that. I mean, they have some physics, but they don't understand the nature of human interventions and behavioral interventions and why they need to be tested in a randomized trial. They're scared. They do it. Then they got one more thing that really got them going. The greatest thing that could ever happen to them. They saw that Donald Trump didn't do it. And the moment he didn't do it, they knew they were right. Because if he didn't do it, I gotta, but it's gotta be right, doesn't it? It's gotta be right if he doesn't do it because he 
always does the wrong thing, at least that's in their mind. But the truth is that even a broken watch is right twice a day. And he had something, some intuition where he, you know, some of the things he said were probably accurate. He's like, look at this guy Fauci, he's saying that it works so much. Just last week he said it didn't, okay? He was on to something that the guy flip-flopped. And he has an intuition that if you flip-flop so quickly, and there wasn't a major study that broke in the New England Journal that week, that probably you're making up some BS, okay? And he, has, he was right about that intuition. He had another intuition that was right, which was that it was probably the case that kids should be back in school. That was a correct intuition on his part. Now, does he have intuitions that are wrong? Absolutely, because the pretest probability of what he says is low. But occasionally he has intuitions that are right, and you have to judge it based on the best available evidence, and the best available evidence showed that on schools. He was very right. Okay, so the Cochrane Review comes out. And it's a blow to these masking zealots. And they say, well, observational studies show it works. Yeah, observational studies conducted by authors who are so conflicted. They've already written the change.org petition that we need to mask children in Massachusetts schools. And then they publish in the New England Journal of Medicine masking children in Massachusetts schools with a sample size of two schools d that are not doing the masking. And masking has this big benefit. There is so much, ana so what am I to believe? They're, they have, you know, motivated reasoning. That's one point. The second point is there's so much analytical flexibility in observational studies. There's issues with time zero. There's issues with residual confounding. There's issues with analytical flexibility. There's so much analytical flexibility. You can get any answer you want from masks are a parachute, which is the CDC's 95% reduction study, to masks are murderous, which is what some other people get. Now, the reason you don't see as many masks are murderous studies in the biomedical literature is that it's filtered through the lens of what people believe are plausible. It's not filtered through a lens of what is true. It's what people believe is plausible. And that lens tends not to believe that it's very harmful. Even I don't believe it's very harmful. I believe it's, it's harmful in the way that, you know, there is a subjective, it's subjectively uncomfortable to wear the mask. That's not nothing. That's a harm, you know. Uh, is it a big harm? No. Uh, there are some people in whom it's really harmful if they can't hear and the doctors are wearing masks and they're losing out on the communication with the doctor. That's very, very harmful. If they're suffering from dyspnea and you put it on, if it's a pregnant woman delivering a child, I can't imagine how angry she must be to have to wear the mask when she's doing this act that is literally called labor. I mean, it's literally called labor, okay? It's got to be laborious and requires one would wish to breathe freely. So it's stupid. Masking is a zealotry. The reason I like to talk about it is it's a paradigm for evidence-based medicine. I mean, autologous stem cell transplant for breast cancer had the same devotees as masking two-year-olds, okay? Uh, uh, the Impella has the same devotees. Where's the randomized trial for Impella? Where's the randomized trial for aducanumab that shows a benefit on how people feel and function? Where is the randomized trial for one-third of cancer drugs that don't have a randomized trial? Where are these randomized trials? We need randomized trials to prove what works or we're no better than the primitive ancestors we came from. We learned about randomization in 1950. I have a new piece out in uh, Substack where I ask, you know, why did it take us so long? You could have imagined the ancient Egyptians could have had randomization. They didn't. Once it took us a long time because there's something about human beings that make us so cocksure that mechanism predicts the future. Why? Because in our day-to-day -day lives, that's how we construct causality. I burn myself on a match, so I know don't touch the match when it's hot. You know, little things like that is how we learn causality because it's evolutionarily adaptive. But when you talk about large numbers, large data sets, large interventions, you don't have an intuition about that. You don't because that was never evolutionarily adaptive. You don't have an intuition about whether or not a beta blocker when taken for two years can lower mortality two percentage points in heart failure. You don't. You can't possibly. Your human faculties were never developed to perceive such a small difference in so many people. You certainly have an intuition that stepping on a nail is bad and dropping something on your hand hurts. Of course you do. And yet in our mind, we try to conflate medicine, which is inherently a population or group thing. I know people talk about even though we personalize all interventions for the individual, ultimately, we always rely on aggregate population data for causality in our prescriptions to the individual. It's very rare that you actually can get a good N of one study. It's not impossible. I do think that for some subjective endpoints that are transient, you can get some things. But for objective endpoints, um, for, for uh, uh, living longer, um, for preventing SARS-CoV-2, it's very difficult, if not impossible. The, the randomness far exceeds any signal that can be ascertained from, from your anecdote. Okay, that's a little bit of a tangent and maybe more than you want to know. But my point on this, the Cochrane Review, it is damning. And yes, the Cochrane authors say more randomized trials are ne necessary. Let's talk about that. Who should have run those studies? How about a guy who literally in one month has changed his point of view on masks, 
who literally controls a $6 billion federal budget, of which some of that money can be apportioned for randomized controlled trials. Who is this guy? Tony Fauci. He could have run this study. He chose to run zero studies. Why would you run zero studies? I mean, I just think even if you believe masking works, you have to acknowledge running zero studies is stupid. He didn't even run studies of cloth mask versus surgical mask versus N95. We could have learned much earlier, which people think is superior. He didn't even run studies of different brands of masks. Maybe some KN94-5s actually are good. I don't know. I doubt it, but maybe it is the case. He didn't run any studies. How is not running any studies the right number? I ask you that. Okay, you may quibble that you can't run a random study of nothing versus masking. Sure. But how can you quibble that no studies should ever have been run in the United States? It is an inde indefensible proposition. And it reflects an arrogance, I think, a deep arrogance and ignorance of history. And it is a failure so colossal it will reverberate throughout history. They'll look back and say, these primitive fools, they ran zero studies on NPIs. Zero. So I don't know what to say. The absence of evidence is not evidence absence. Sure, yeah, but the pretest probability is that it don't work, okay? Most things don't work. In biomedicine, most things don't work. You are coming from outside of biomedicine. You do not know what a slog it has been in biomedicine to have anything that works. I always tell people when I teach classes, I say, you know, you may, you know, my class will come very critically and you'll find a lot of things we're doing. Maybe we'll question. Okay. And you may be pessimistic, be like, oh my God, as a doctor, so much of what I'm doing is not working. You should be grateful because in the history of humanity, at least we live in a time where some of what we do may actually help. Some is better than nothing. And probably for many, many thousands of years, the entire existence of healthcare professionals did nothing but hurt people. Maybe it was a net decrement on survival. And we run the risk of going back to that stone age as these ignorant people tell us we can't do randomized trials. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The observational studies work, even though they're terribly confounded of all these problems. These ignorant people run the risk of driving us into the stone age. It's bigger than COVID. It applies to Impella. It applies to cancer drugs. It applies to Alzheimer's drugs. It is a single unifying theme. What is the level of evidence you need to justify imposing upon others or even telling them what you think is right? You need good evidence. You can't just make things up, okay? So those are my thoughts on this issue. Nobody knows what they're talking about here. I mean, very few people. I've seen very few intelligent things said about it. I've just seen a sea of nonsense. And uh, I mean, it's clear. If you, you know, if you believe in anything, I, was always, I always tell trainees, never put your heart and soul in any chemotherapy drug or any regimen. Don't become a true believer. You can use them. You can even like them. You can even say they work well in my practice. But don't put your heart and soul in them because it's very hard to let go of something when you put your heart and soul in. And it's very likely in the course of your careers that a lot of things that you're doing will be found to be lacking or improved upon. So don't put your heart and soul in anything. And the same is true here. You should be very neutral about masking. I didn't complain about it when it was initially done. I thought it would be a short-term thing. I didn't think these zealots would manage to ram it down our throat for three years. But I did start to complain when they didn't even launch a single randomized study. I thought that was a bit odd. I thought that they would be concerned about knowledge. And then when they didn't do any in children, when they took it down to two, that's when I started writing my op-eds in 2021. You can go check, the, check my thread. My pinned tweet is literally every op-ed I've ever written on COVID. I wrote one in MedPage Today. I wrote one at The Atlantic. And when it went on and on and on, and you got a two-year-old that has literally never seen a face uh, uh, in a hospital setting or among his classmates, um, and then you start masking the two-year-old for two, from two to four, um, and on and on and on and on. I mean, potentially there's a person who enrolled in a daycare at two is now five, and this is, has been masked for most of their time among other kids. That's horrific, you know, without any data that it actually helped anybody. I think that's just totally crazy. I mean, even if you think it might help somebody, you have some burden to generate data. Okay, those are my thoughts. Absence of evidence, evidence of absence, Cochrane Review. Run the, do an RCT and prove to me under what circumstances it works. I say the same thing for the cancer drug makers, the same thing for the Alzheimer's drugs, and the same thing for masking, masking people. But I'm pretty sure it doesn't work because most things don't work. Okay, you like this video, you need to do like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below, subscribe to this channel. These are my thoughts.